Good afternoon. Every once in a while, we all share a common experience that brings us together. So I'm gonna give you a bit of a test. <clears throat> I'm gonna read a quote from a letter. In view of this situation, you may think it desirable to have some permanent contact maintained between the administration and the group of physicists working on chain reactions in America. One possible way of achieving this might be for you to entrust with this task a person who has your confidence and who could perform, who could perhaps serve in an unofficial capacity. Anybody want to venture a guess what letter I just pulled that quote from? Einstein's letter, August the 2nd, 1939. That letter started a chain of events that gives us in this room today all something that we have in common. We wouldn't be here today if it had not been for this letter and the administration's reaction to it. So from those beginnings, we now have Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So today we're here to celebrate the 80th anniversary. This is sort of the end of our 80th anniversary celebration. And we are privileged to have some people who can talk much more eloquently about history than I will. So I'm gonna turn it over to David Kime and Dave's gonna introduce our speakers today. Let me thank you for being here. We appreciate you being a part of this celebration and we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you all for, for being here. I, I don't know what that, do you hear that sound? That, well, at 2.20, there will be a national alert to all of our mobile phones. So please uh, silence your phones. <laughs> um, the alternative is that we turn them all on so that we can hear what it would sound like for all of us <laughs> to get a phone call at the same time. Uh, so that'll that'll hit us at two twenty, and we'll we'll take a moment. Um, I'm Dave Kime. I'm the communications and community engagement director for the laboratory. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it's our privilege to have um, these three panelists to talk about the history of the Manhattan Project and Oak Ridge National Lab uh, in particular. Alan Carr uh, serves as program manager and senior historian at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, he has been at the lab since 2003, um, lectures, has written many publications, um, written about nuclear testing history and the evolution of Los Alamos Lab. Um, he's been featured as a guest on local, national, and international radio and television programs. He uh, completed his graduate studies at Texas Tech. Um, Ray Smith um, has served as the city's historian since 2015. He had a long career at the Y-12 National Security Complex, retiring in 2017. His last 10 years there was as the historian at Y-12. Um, he has uh, testified before the House of Representatives uh, to help establish the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, um, is on the member of the Tennessee Historical Commission, appointed in both 2017 and 2022. He co-hosts a video cast, Hidden History. He writes a weekly history column that is in the Oak Ridger and the Morgan County today. He's produced um, documentaries on Y-12 and Manhattan Project history. He's written 14 books, 14 books. <laughs> I publish the historically speaking column every year as a book. Oh, well, that, that yeah. doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, I wrote that. <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> and Dick Groves, Dick Groves, uh, first visited Oak Ridge in 1967 with his grandfather, General Leslie Groves. Uh, those of you familiar with Manhattan Project history understand the significance of General Groves. Um, Dick is a graduate of West Point, but unlike his father and grandfather, did not go into the Corps of Engineers. 
He worked in real estate and development projects in 25 countries around the world, which gave him a perspective on what his grandfather accomplished here and what he'll talk about. Six years ago, he began researching the history of making the bomb, and he's working on a 13-episode documentary series. We're thrilled to have uh, Dick Groves uh, joining us today as well. So let's please welcome our panelists. We want to uh, provide time for, for questions. Uh, so I, I will, I have a couple of questions queued up for each of you, but if you have a question at any point, uh, raise your hand and then I'll open the floor after a couple of questions to each person. I wanted to start with Alan and just ask, um, give us Los Alamos Lab's perspective on Oak Ridge National Lab. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I mean, I'm excited to hear that there were other parts of the Manhattan Project. We <laughs> knew. <laughs> no, you, you know, at, uh, I was going to give you this mug, but no, I, <laughs> you know, I, I think that I think that my colleagues are going to want to answer this question as well. Dick was talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to steal a little bit of uh, Dick's thunder because we, uh, when we, when we encounter different audiences who are interested in the Manhattan Project, I, I don't think there's a real appreciation by most people for the scale of the Manhattan Project. Uh, General Groves uh, was in charge of a project that was all over this country, even had a couple of installations in Canada. Uh, over half a million people were employed by the Manhattan Project at one point or another. And uh, if you're looking at personnel, Los Alamos was a small part, relatively speaking, to Oak Ridge and Hanford of the Manhattan Project. I think that we had an important mission like the other sites, of course, but it was a huge national project. And, you know, uh, as the historian at Los Alamos, this is something that I've been aware of for many, many years. It was a team effort. It was a national effort. And you can have the best bomb design in the world but you don't have a nuclear weapon without the proper materials for it. Uh, and that was something that uh, certainly couldn't be done at Los Alamos. It needed entire communities and factories to be built to, to enable that. And of course, uh, each of the sites, you know, not only Los Alamos, of course, Oak Ridge and Hanford, these were pretty versatile and had some incredible people at, at all of them. And so for me, there's just a, a tremendous uh, appreciation for this, for this site. And not just historically speaking, but what goes on here as well. We've had a remarkable couple of days over at Y12 and here at Oak Ridge today is uh, at the National Laboratory as well. So I'm grateful for the experience. It's always it's a great pleasure to be here. And we very much appreciate you past, present, and future uh, from Los Alamos. Thank, thank you very much for that answer. Um, Ray, can you speak um, a bit to how the community of Oak Ridge came to be? So, so quickly, give folks a perspective I, I, on, on yeah. what was here before and how quickly it developed. Yes, and, and it, it developed quickly because of his grandfather and the fact that he made decisions quickly and understood the need to have a place, something, somewhere he could start building what was going to be needed for the bomb. But, but prior to that, this was a, a community of about half a dozen small communities. New Bethel, as you know, the church is still here near the lab. It was one of those communities and they still have annual reunions every year on Memorial Day, as does Wheat. Wheat had their reunion last week. But these small communities all of a sudden had to vacate. They had to move off of their land in a matter of weeks. And that was literally the result of General Groves traveling down here to see what was this East Tennessee site that had been, they'd been looking at it all summer in 42. So it wasn't just a, a snap decision on his part, but it was a quick decision where it had been delayed. But, but in, uh, in September, when he came down here and made that decision by November, they were actually beginning the administration building, which is where the federal office building is today. And by February of 43, construction was starting at both Y-12 and at X-10 graphite reactor. And then in June, starting at K-25. So it was fast and furious. And things started happening. He hired Stone and Webster. 
to do construction, J.A. Jones to do construction, uh, Sid Moore Owens and Merrill to design the town. They started out thinking they were going to build a town for just a few thousand people. And by August of 1945, there were 75,000 people living here. Fifth largest city in the state of Tennessee. Wasn't on any map. That's a quick version, Dave. That's <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Dick? May I pick up on, on one? Yes, please? please. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for having me. And uh, I've been studying, uh, as, as was mentioned, I've been studying this for about six years. I have a tendency to go down rabbit holes. So I, if I uh, go too far, please stop I'll me. I'll moderate you. <laughs> please. Uh, but I just wanted to pick up on something Ray said. So first of all, uh, my grandfather uh, was assigned the what was in the Manhattan Engineer District in September of 1942. And as you said, they'd been looking at this site for, for months. It was the uh, Elsa site. I think, El does Elsa still exist? Elsa uh, it, it was a railroad stop, yeah. Um, and, gate and Groves ended up in the assignment because there had been a very fine engineer officer, Colonel James Marshall, very well respected, who had been put into the position, he was out of, uh, he'd been doing work up in New York with the Corps of Engineers during the mobilization construction, which was this massive project to build forts, training camps, munitions factories, ports of embarkation, airfields, uh, ramping up for World War II. And Marshall had been sent, sent down to acquire the site, but he didn't understand that and he went, he went uh, and started to follow very methodical uh, steps to assess it. And then he started to question whether the whole project made sense. Um, again, very responsible. He was doing feasibility analysis that you'd expect from an engineer. But Vannevar Bush, uh, have any of you heard of Vannevar Bush? Okay, uh -huh. Vannevar Bush and James Conant had engaged the engineers with FDR's approval to start pushing construction. Um, so then just to uh, I'll refer here. So how things got done so quickly, how Groves was able to get things done so quickly goes back to 1940 and the start of mobilization construction and a general, some of you may have heard of named Brahan Somerville. Groves worked for Somerville. Somerville is the one who authorized the Pentagon in 1940. Uh, got uh, FDR's approval to build the Pentagon. And just to give you some idea of who Somerville was, I said this the other, yesterday, but I didn't make it very clear. Somerville ordered the plans, the architectural plans for the Pentagon on a Thursday and told Groves and Bergstrom, the architect for the Pentagon, to have the plans ready on Monday. So that was the, that was the nature of work during the mobilization construction. Everything was pushed, and uh, uh, I'll skip the whole part about the construction division, but the Corps of Engineers was sitting there and for two years had been doing this enormous construction project. Uh, Gross was contracting projects at the rate of about $10 billion a month in, in current terms. So as he said at the time, he became the head of, of what became the Manhattan Project. It was a real step down for him. <laughs> how do you uh how do you explain to people your grandfather's role in the manhattan project oppenheimer tends to be viewed if you pick one person it's oppenheimer but how do you explain your grandfather well, i was part of it? i was confused when i first started thinking about this because his title didn't sound particularly notable to me director of the manhattan project director but in part because I was uh, working in development for so long in uh, with multiple disciplines, you know, in a very large scale development project, you'll have planners, architects, engineers, ultimately construction. And I, when I started to look at it through that angle and realized that the greatest challenges in the Manhattan Project, certainly the science challenges, Los Alamos, I, are were phenomenal and they had 30 plus Nobel scientists and told I think uh, past and future uh, working on the 
but um, the construction challenges were just enormous. And here was a man who witnessed this general, Somerville, uh, driving the mobilization construction, had came from the Corps of Engineers, so he knew the function of the Corps of Engineers. And all of a sudden, he was handed this huge construction project. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have heard, heard this, but in March of 1939, Niels Bohr arrives in the U.S. in January 1939, and um, Fermi is sent to the Navy. Has anyone heard this story? Mm -hmm. In March 1939, um, March 16th, they have a meeting at Columbia with Dean Pegram and uh, Zillard, Wigner, and Bohr and John Wheeler. And uh, they decide that Fermi is going to go warn, warn the, the government. He's going to go see the Department of the Navy. And he goes off, and on the March 17th, he sees them. The Navy doesn't respond very well. When he's shown in to see the admiral who he's meeting with, the aide says, there's a WAP to see you. So Fermi has just won the Nobel Prize. He's escaped to the U.S. But um, the others at that meeting go to Princeton that night and they're talking with Bohr and Bohr says, we don't have to worry about a bomb. There'll never be a bomb because we can't separate. We can't, he, um, Bohr has figured out that it's U-235 and says it'll be impossible. You'd have to turn the entire nation into a factory. Well, of course, that's what Ma Manhattan does. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I want to get this out of the way. First, because the the Oppenheimer movie has allowed us locally to talk about Oak Ridge and its spot, although we're mentioned sort of in passing. But um, Alan, what was it like to be working on a blockbuster movie at, at Los Alamos? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't ask him a they didn't, uh, You know, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I thought I'd get a call to give maybe, you know, maybe Matt Damon some pointers, Gillian uh, Murphy, perhaps that. That didn't uh, that didn't happen. We we think that uh, uh, one of the uh, researchers for the movies did reach out to our repository for photos and films and things like that, uh, but really uh, no direct interaction with the movie uh, at all. I, it probably would have been a little bit different in some regards if they had. <laughs> uh, but again, my advice was was not asked. Uh, I think you know the, kind of the neat thing about the movie, uh, though, at coming to Los Alamos was that they literally did bring the production to New Mexico and they brought it to our little town. And so some of the scenes that you see in the movie, uh, such as the scenes in Oppenheimer's house, were shot in his house at Los Alamos, which is which is still there. Uh, the lodge, where he has the pep rally after the atomic bombings that I don't think happened. Uh, that, you know, that the lodge is, is there and it's been a part of the community since well before uh, the yeah. Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project showed up in town. There were, uh, you know, those uh, the scenes, you know, there were, I, I think there were Matt Damon sightings at uh, the taco place across the street, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Everybody had a little story to tell from the movie. The other thing is that many, the, the production was very interested in getting current laboratory employees uh, roles in the film as, as actors. They didn't. Have, I've got a poor <laughs> agent, I guess. It's a, <laughs> no, no, I didn't try out. They they opened up the the yeah. high school gymnasium for tryouts, and I I think there was a hockey game on or something, so I missed it. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, several. They really wanted to get current scientists into yeah. uh, into the movie, and so not only scientists, but also some of our. Uh, uh, I know of scientists who were in there, people who were in other parts of the laboratory, one, at least one person from public affairs was there. And so it's fun for us to watch the uh, movie because several of our, our colleagues pop up from, from place to place. And so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it is, there's been a lot more tourism as a result of that. People are interested in it. We, we always get a lot of questions uh, in our shop at uh, Los Alamos, but we got a whole lot more <laughs> during the summer. We had some cool projects that we were working on as well, and those have come to fruition now, some of them. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, it was it was one of these things we looked at as, a, as an opportunity, uh, interest in the, the, in the Manhattan Project, uh, but also in, in Los Alamos, because so much of it takes place there. Unfortunately, you don't get to see Oak Ridge and Hanford and these places that made it uh, but that made it a possibility for this to be successful. But we decided to try and, and ride the wave. 
you know, we have this maybe once in a lifetime, once in a generation at least opportunity. We really wanted to try to make the most of it for the laboratory, for, for our community, and, and hopefully to bring awareness to all of the other communities uh, that made the, made the Manhattan Project what it was. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. definitely an opportunity for publicity. Um, I, I'll open this to any of you. Um, talk about the recruitment of the scientific and technical staff to the Manhattan Project. Because as Ray described, there was nothing here. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, this was folks from all over the country, Berkeley and University of Chicago and MIT, Carnegie Tech, et cetera. Um, elaborate on what described for folks. How were these folks recruited? Where did they come from? How did they decide where to put them across yeah. the project? Yeah, do you, do you want me to start? Because I bet we all have thoughts on, on this. It, it, this uh, uh, initially, it was a slow start for Oppenheimer. So you'll remember in the movie that he's got this military uniform on. Now, I don't know if he ever wore it, but he did order the uniform of a, of a lieutenant colonel, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I don't think he ever put it on or wore it at Los Alamos. But originally, the laboratory was going to be a military installation. So think about this recruiting uh, speech. Oppenheimer calls you up and says, hey, I know, I know you're working on radar at MIT, but what if you leave that work behind, join the Army, go through basic training, you can leave your family behind as well, and you can join me, Lieutenant Colonel Oppenheimer. It didn't work. Yeah, I, I did not detect much of a response there, and that was the case in 1943 as well. Uh, and so anyway, at that point, this is where I think that, you know, General Groves, it, it, he was willing to listen and to adapt based on the people that he brought into the project, such as Oppenheimer. He trusted them. Um, you know, when you've got people in uniform, it's a lot easier to control them. Uh, you know, there's a lot, it's, it makes security easier, things like that. That's why that was the way it was initially. But Oppenheimer knew that, you know, I can't recruit people this way, as it turned out. Uh, and of course, you know, there was some, th there was really almost no exchange of information due to compartmentalization either for understandable reasons. So negotiations took place. Mm -hmm. And what ultimately happened is that the University of California was brought in to administer the laboratory during the war, not knowing what they were signing up for. They just said, you know, if it's in the national interest during this time of war, you can use our brand. And so, now Oppenheimer's recruiting spiel was, hey, how would you like to bring your family along on a great Wild West adventure, join the faculty of the University of California, and we'll win the war. So this got a much more positive response. Uh, the way that we tended to get people at Los Alamos, I think, is probably the way it still works here at, at Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, and many other places, and that is just networks of graduate students. You know, a lot of professors reached out, brought in their graduate students. And uh, Oppenheimer became, he became a very good recruiter after that and assembled a, a, a great staff. And so I think when you look at the laboratories today, which are civilian run, that's been since day one, since the UC brought, uh, came in, and which is still part of the contract at Los Alamos. And uh, that was one of those quick things that was done on the fly. And, and I don't think General Groves was excited about it, but he listened to those experts that he brought in and, and made changes. And I think that was one of the really important early ones. Can I, it, I'd like to add something. It, it, when I was driving around today, I, I asked about uh, the audience today and they, I, I thought it was a Y-12 audience. And I was told, no, this is a really an X-10 audience. It's the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, not the Y-12. Um, but just to add, so that so Los Alamos is the is uh, could I call it the Fast Vision Laboratory? Well, I, th I think his original job before Los Alamos, he was the head of the Fast Vision Committee or something like that. But yeah. I want to mention the other labs, um, and again to uh, give a little perspective. This morning you were talking about Einstein's letter, and often I'm I'm trying to reboot the story because. I refer to three acts. You have the Manhattan Project, which starts in 1942 and 1945. But that first part between the discovery of fission on Christmas Eve, 1938, and FDR giving an initial signal, um, an initial approval to start work, October 12th, 1939, in between are roughly a thousand days, act two. And what's going on then? You know, it, it wasn't simply that Einstein wrote a letter and then work started on the Manhattan Project. There was a long period in between. And the key character in that is Vannevar Bush, who runs the national uh, NDRC and then the OSRD. And um, 
in time, they it, it, when the OSRD gets started in 1942, they have um, uh, they have the or 1941. They have the um, the Met Lab in Chicago, which relates directly to X10, which relates directly to the reactors in in Hanford, and they had the um, the Rad Lab, which is Y12 Lawrence's Rad Lab, and they have uh, the SAM laboratory at Columbia Urey's laboratory, which was working on gaseous diffusion and the barrier for gaseous diffusion. So understand it. it Again, the the story every time when I talk to people and they say, "Well, what are you working on?" and I tell them, I say, "Do you know about the Manhattan Project?" They say, "Oh yes," and I ask, "How many people worked on the Manhattan Project?" and the answer is usually some number that makes sense for Los Alamos: two thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand. But it's not six hundred thousand. Um, actually, the peak was in June nineteen forty four with one hundred twenty nine thousand all over, but six hundred thousand over the term. So you you're part of you're part of the story I'm trying to restore the fuel story. You mentioned something I want to come back to about um, General Groves meeting. You know, you, you rattled off Niels Bohr, Leo Szilard, uh, Enrico Fermi, Eugene Wigner, and and you mentioned that he he listened. How, how did your grandfather? work with these scientists, right? I mean, because I would love his secrets for working with physicists. Well, again, <laughs> without giving a long lecture, on, I've thought a lot about this because I've watched through my lifetime, well, actually going back to 1947, there's a film, The Beginning or the End. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. An MGM film? It was, a, it was an attempt to actually tell the whole Manhattan Project story. It had industrialists in it by name, you know, uh, Percival Keith. Dobie Keith, K-25, had a char character who played Dobie Keith. Um, so, but in my lifetime, I got to watch uh, first Brian Dennehy, then Paul Newman, and now Matt Damon. I worked for my grandfather as a teenager, and none of those are anything like my grandfather. If you want to, if you want to see him, there's some clips of him on, um, on YouTube where you can see him holding uh, plutonium and and talking and he wasn't a very wasn't a he wasn't a, uh, a he wasn't a screamer he never cursed um but he absolutely knew what he was doing because again he'd been an, a corps of engineers officer he's very smart gone to mit gone to west point spent 20 years in the corps of engineers mastering the development work of the corps of engineers and then he has this crucial rehearsal starting in 1940 with the mobilization construction and the example of Brehan Somerville. So um, please remind me what your question was. Yeah, the what, what was the dynamic? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, was it, you know, so he goes out. Scientist. So he's put in the position on September 17th, 1942. October the 5th, he goes to the Met Lab and he meets with Zillard. They end up famously, uh, if you want to read their whole books about Groves and Zillard, it's not particularly important to how the bomb got built in the end, or but it's interesting in the same way that some of the drama in Oppenheimer was interesting. It's interpersonal history. So what I've been asked is, well, how did he make this brilliant insight in hiring Oppenheimer? Um, I've talked to Jim Connect and others about this. And I say, well, you have to sit in his perspective. Again, he's running this vast multidisciplinary project. And it's evident at the time that it's going to be enormous. It's already been underway when he takes over. It's been underway by the army for months. But he, he knows of the work they've been doing going back into 1941 and 1940. And here's a man who's very good at communicating, Oppenheimer, very good at communicating to someone. So contrast that. He goes to the Met Lab. He gets grief from Zillard and Wigner and others. <laughs> He's got the responsibility to get the project done. Here's a man who communicates clearly to him, shows him some respect. Um, and so there's, I just know from work I've done and work with developers who have vast projects, if they can find somebody that's got knowledge of a very specific field that's crucial to the subject, and that person is somebody they can communicate with, that's gold. 
So I, I think the, the choice is actually quite easy for him. When he looked at the options, he would have preferred to have Lawrence. He probably would have preferred to have someone like Compton. But it was understood Lawrence was running the RAD lab and was going to deliver Y12. And Compton was heading the MET, Met lab and working on plutonium. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wanted to follow on with, with a couple of quick stories about this. You know, General Groves was an incredibly highly experienced and educated uh, engineer, proven. And, uh, you know, the a couple of stories came to mind when you asked the question about his interaction with the scientists. So one of them is from Vannevar Bush, I believe, who, who was mentioned earlier. After they had their first meeting, uh, I think it was Bush. He wrote. It was Bush. Yeah. I fear we are in the soup. Yeah, yes, I remember. <laughs> General Groves and Vannevar Bush became very close collaborators. Yeah, yeah but there threats. was a misunderstanding. You know. <laughs> Groves was sent to meet Bush immediately to take over the project, and he was going to take over the project right away. I mean, he ends up in he ends up in uh, in Oak Ridge four or five days later, acquiring Oak Ridge. So things are going to start to move, yeah. but. Bush doesn't know who he is. <laughs> it's a great story. And he doesn't yeah, really. So he goes to Bush to get briefed. Yeah. And Bush is, who is this man? Bush is, you know, more important than Groves. Bush actually ends up, he's effectively Groves's, one yeah. of Groves's uh, several bosses. And so uh, Groves uh, is rather pushy and it's noted. And Bush, uh, as soon as Groves is gone, appeals to Patterson, I think, I think to, so. to one of the secretary, secretary yeah. of the uh, secretary Patterson or to Marshall or Stim he complained to somebody and uh, it was no Somerville. Somerville had, had uh, managed that maneuver right. and it, that was it was a done deal. They had Groves. So within it's, about a week, they were. Yes, I, I think that, you know, with the Norris Bradbury had a similar story. Norris was our second director. He was there during World War II and was the director for 25 years afterwards. And, uh, you know, he had great respect for General Groves as well. He said, you know, General Groves, he, he seems to have the uncanny ability to say the worst thing to physicists whenever he comes <laughs> in contact with them. But these scientists like Bush, Norris Bradbury, Robert Oppenheimer, of course, I, I think that they recognized that this was the right person for the job. Right. Uh, and this was an exceptionally large, complex, very challenging uh, job. And they had great admiration for him. And I think that those scientists who got to know the general uh, really recognized that. The ones who didn't and saw him from afar, you know, he was just kind of this, you know, terse, he doesn't understand or appreciate what we're doing. Those who knew General Groves had a very different perspective. And I think that time has treated the general well as we have got to, uh, as, as, as we become more familiar with the complexities and scale of the project over time. Uh, General Groves and Oppenheimer were, were just opposites in so many ways, uh, but were such good partners. And I say partners in this sense. Sometimes you will see Oppenheimer mentioned as the scientific director of the Manhattan Project. Uh, there was no such position. There, there was one commander of the Manhattan Project. That was General Groves. Oppenheimer was the director of Los Alamos, which was an important job. But it was just one of many directorships, another one being here, Hanford, Chicago, Berkeley, all of these other places. And so, uh, you know, General Groves, I mean, he really was a national hero. And I think, uh, again, I think tr time has treated him well, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. How did Oppenheimer, as a scientific, uh, oh, there I go. I was about to say something <laughs> wrong. Scientific director, <laughs> as the director of Los Alamos. Right, right. How did he interact with, with Oak Ridge? You know, he had, obviously, the gaseous diffusion, thermal diffusion, electromagnetic separation, and the plutonium pilot plant. Yes. All in Oak Ridge. Do you know? It, it was more limited than you would think. And actually, I think Ray's the best one. Uh, Ray and Dick both have perspectives on this. Ray studied this. Uh, yeah, actually, Oppenheimer, we can only document him being here just a very few times. He did recommend S50, the thermal diffusion plant, and that was to get the separation of the uranium-235 started as feed materials to go into first the beta calutrons at Y12 and then the gaseous diffusion. So it, he knew what was going on here. He actually sent Richard Feynman here uh, to tell Tennessee Eastman not to stack their uranium on either side of a concrete block wall. Tennessee Eastman didn't realize that neutrons just go right through those walls. 
But so he knew what was going on here very much so because he needed that plutonium, he needed that uranium-235, and Y-12 was very slow at producing. As they said, it's going to take an entire efforts of a nation to get enough uranium-235 for a bomb. That's why Great Britain came to the United States and said, we don't have the resources. You build a bomb, we'll send our scientists over. And that was a part of getting ready for what had turned into the Manhattan Project. So Oppenheimer knew about Oak Ridge. His brother, Frank Oppenheimer, actually worked at Y-12 and lived in Oak Ridge in 1943. So we know he visited his brother. We actually know that he had dinner with uh, Colonel Nichols in Colonel Nichols' house up on Olney Lane. But we don't know a lot more. And I have to say that the most prominent picture you see of Robert Oppenheimer was made by Ed Westcott setting up at the guest house here in Oak Ridge. That happened in 46. So he knew about Oak Ridge, but he didn't spend a lot of time here. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions uh, yet in the, in the audience or online? You can submit them also in the chat. We have about 250 folks tuned in online. Um, while people work up the courage to ask a question, <laughs> Um, one detail from the Manhattan Project era is that um, the South was under Jim Crow. Mm. And so Oak Ridge was a segregated city. The Manhattan Project was segregated. Um, sci Black scientists could not come to Oak Ridge, Ernest Wilkins being uh, yes. perhaps the most prominent. Edward Teller told him he probably should not come down here yeah. just so he could keep him working for him. Well, they wanted, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Speak speak to that because yes. we, we can't overlook that part I of agree. the history. It, and, and I think he had a similar experience in, in Hanford, but not nearly as much in Los Alamos. I don't know right. about Los Alamos. I'll speak to that. You, you do, yeah. please. But here in Oak Ridge, uh, there was a very deliberate effort to maintain the similarity for what was going on in the surrounding community. So segregation was the normal. And uh, the Black people that came to work here, they were not allowed to bring their children, didn't have schools for them. Uh, they were also not allowed to live together as a family. They were put in hutments, 16 by 16 foot plywood, buildings with a heater in the middle and uh, they were separated men and women one of the most famous stories we have about that is katie strickland we're at the k-25 at the uh, happy valley place where the construction workers were living and they had those compartmentalized uh, hutments she asked her husband to bring her a piece of metal out of the construction site she made it into a biscuit pan. She would cook biscuits on that stove in her hutman and share those biscuits with the guard. And he would let her husband stay with her longer. So she figured out a way around it. We have that pan over at the K-25 History Center if you've not seen it. But you're right, it was the Jim Crow South. Uh, they did get jobs that were the best paying jobs they'd had. And they would send the money back to their families. But they were not treated the same as white people were. And uh, that was the norm in the time. It's hard to understand and appreciate today, but that existed. And Alan, how about Los Alamos? Yeah, at Los Alamos, I don't know of uh, any African-Americans who, who were there in either a, a technical or non-technical capacity. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is just the demographics of northern New Mexico. Yeah. You know, northern New Mexico is a very diverse place, but not in terms of African Americans. There have traditionally not that been that many uh, in in our community there, relative to a place like Tennessee or, or in the South. And so, um, in terms of the technical work that was done at Los Alamos. African Americans had such extremely limited opportunities because of the racism that was going on in the, in the country at that point in time. And I would say, you know, it was it was very similar for women as well. It was extremely oh, difficult for women to have access to a technical education. There were anomalies, 
we did have women who were who were scientists, but only a couple. We had more who were technicians. Uh, there was a detachment of women's women's army corps who were there, about seventy women in that capacity. But uh, but it was uh, there just was not access, and so that's one thing that's changed, I think, significantly over time. And and we get to enjoy those benefits now. Uh, but uh, but that was not something that the Manhattan Project got to enjoy. You mentioned Mr. Wilkins, uh, and I call him Mr. Wilkins because that's how he's referred to in the um, in the documentation that we have at the National Security Research Center at Los Alamos. Uh, the Manhattan Project needed every qualified person it could get to try and get this important job done in time of war. Edward Teller was doing important work uh, on thermonuclear weapons during the war, and he was not doing it in a vacuum. He had a small team, a group at Los Alamos that was looking at it, and, and not a lot of people know this, but I think that Oppenheimer supported the wartime fusion work to, to as, as much as he could without compromising the main lines of research. It was something that he was interested in and pushed along. Uh, there was an African American by the name of uh, what was his first name? It was uh, was it uh, was it Marvin Wilkins? I should know this. So it's, it's Ernest. It was, so yeah, on me. I think my colleagues yeah. and and Teller is trying to get his help. He's yeah. desperately trying to get Mr. Wilkin, Wilkins' help, Ernest Wilkins' help, because he was a good qualified scientist, highly thought of, and he was not available. And uh, I believe that part of the team he was associated with. Came to came to Tennessee, yeah, they did. and uh, but he would not. He did not, uh, and uh, because he would not, I, it's my understanding he would not subject himself to the right. the treatment that he would have received here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we remember that story, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I think it's inspirational to to us, and that it's important for us to remember that you know those those things that we get to enjoy, the the strength that we have from having a diverse workforce is. It's not been around that long, actually. And so it's something that I think we ought to appreciate and, and continue to nurture. If I could, Dave, just to pick up on the, the women issue and point that uh, we invented the term Calutron girl in 2004. Uh, mm -hmm. These young ladies right out of high school that worked in uh, the Calutrons at Y-12, literally thousands of them were there. Uh, they uh, were called cubicle operators. And this one came back in 2004 and Gladys Owens, and she saw her picture, that famous Ed Westcott picture that has the girls sitting on the stools. And she told Steve Stowe, some of you may remember Steve, who worked here at the lab for years and then was the director at the American Museum of Science and Energy. She told him, that's me in that picture. Steve called me and said, right. I found you a Calutron girl. <laughs> and we started using that term. Now everyone thinks they were Calutron girls. That's what I thought. <laughs> and see, and the, young, the ladies in their 80s and 90s that got to be a part of Denise Kernan's book, The Girls of Atomic City, they just loved the term. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting thing to me to know how that term got introduced into our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Got yeah. one. We have microphones. We have one in the back and one here. I, okay. Uh, Ray mentioned Tennessee Eastman briefly a second ago. I just wondered if you could um, speak a little more about their involvement. Tennessee Eastman? Tennessee their Eastman. Involvement? Yes. Yes, Tennessee Eastman was selected by General Groves like he did for all of the others, DuPont and, and the other companies. <laughs> I, I want to say this kindly, but he, he strong-armed them. He said, you know, for you, you need to do your patriotic well, they were duty. Doing, they were doing, yeah. well, Tennessee Eastman was doing Holston. Yeah, up to the Holston, Holston works. Uh, works were there. And, of course, they were up in Kingsport. But they took on the responsibility. He selected them, I believe, because of their ability to manage a large operation. And they were not in the uranium business for sure but they were selected to manage the operations at Y-12. And by the way, did an excellent job of doing that. Uh, they were there until uh, January 47 or the middle of 46 when the AEC took over Atomic Energy Commission. Tennessee Eastman left, DuPont left here. There were changes being made, but Tennessee Eastman did an excellent job of managing the operation at Y-12. Thanks. 
Jim, Jim Roberto has a microphone. We should. Young scientists who were always about human nature. How could they be told? Well, I'll talk about the other labs. Okay. I think he's really talking mostly about Los Alamos, but the other labs. I can speak a little bit more to that because, yeah, there was. You know, the, the Manhattan Project had uh, top priority for resources. It had basically an unlimited budget, but you don't have an unlimited number of physicists and chemists, metallurgists, and so on. And so there was a lot of recruiting that was done. Um, you know, it took Oppenheimer in some cases months to be able to recruit people to come to work for him. Uh, one example that you never hear of is Robert Bacher. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him, but uh, Bacher was the first physics division leader at Los Alamos. He was basically running half the MIT radiation laboratory. And so Oppenheimer spent a lot of time trying to get Bacher out there. There was a lot of back and forth. Bacher's actually one of the ones who pushed back and said, look, I'm not, I, I have no problem joining the military, but I do have a problem joining the military as a scientist. That's one of the things that resulted in the University of California coming in. Uh, you can, uh, you know, scientists came in different ways at different times. Uh, Isidore Rabi was one of our uh, no, uh, Nobel winning scientists who was there as a consultant. So he was on the staff, but he didn't make the uh, he, he didn't make the commitment to be a full time regular employee. So we had this other category of consultants. And so I think that shows more of the flexibility. Maybe we can't get, you know, John von Neumann full time or, 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 or some of these other folks like Robbie, but maybe we can at least get them here part of the time. Niels Bohr and his son, who also won the Nobel Prize a year later, were both on our staff as consultants and split their time. So there's some flexibility there as well. Um, you know, not everybody who was recruited, we, we weren't able to get them there successfully either. But Oppenheimer spent a lot of time. And and I don't know, maybe that was one thing that General Grove saw in him. I mean, if nothing else, Robert Oppenheimer could be. He was capable of being extremely charismatic and, and convincing. In terms of the information that was giving, uh, given, it kind of depended with where you would be in the organizational structure. Of course, a vast, vast, vast majority of the people working for the Manhattan Project had no idea what the end product was. The most common job was construction worker. These, these facilities did not exist. There is no Manhattan Project without the construction workers. And as was mentioned by Dick earlier, 130,000 people at the same time working, but 500, 600,000 people working total. What does that tell you about the attrition rate? It wasn't that pleasant a place to work for a lot of construction workers, especially, especially hampered, especially. Yes, it was, it was very difficult conditions. And so, you know, a lot of people, you know, imagine having a tough job. The pay is not great. Maybe you're being segregated at some sites as well. Uh, a lot of people didn't stay and, and, and they left for, for these reasons. And if you don't know what the end product of your labor is, you know, that's not going to help either. And so, on the other hand, if you're trying to recruit somebody like I mentioned before, Robert Bacher or Hans Bethe, as was mentioned, or Enrico Fermi, who had been working at the, uh, um, who'd been working, of course, at Chicago first, they could know a little bit more. But uh, but compartmentalization was practiced rigorously, and for totally understandable reasons. But it did have some uh, it did have some problems as well, and that it wasn't that great for morale. And I think it did kill the synergy to some extent. But it was a necessary thing to do during World War II. Mm -hmm. So I hope that got at least to some of the the, uh, the scientists had to be told you're going to work on uranium fission, right? Right. Uh, now, now, to put it in perspective, actually, another number to throw out there. Uh, at Los Alamos, the technical staff, these are scientists and junior scientists, uh, and I think technicians, uh, we're about 1,700 people. So keep that in mind. 1,700 out of 129,000, I think, was the exact number in summer of 1945. Those are the people who would have known. Who, who would have needed that bigger picture. I think, you know, again, going back to General Groves and his flexibility and willingness to listen, even maybe begrudgingly sometimes, 
I think he would have been more content to put everybody in a uniform and put them in a cubicle and not let them talk to each other and just give them a page of work to do every day. But, but Oppenheimer and others knew that that's no way to get science done. The general listened and allowed for some compartment or, or allowed some of those restrictions to be taken away, I think to great benefit to the project. Can I, uh, so uh, again, this is the, uh, you all should resent this. This is the Los Alamos story being told here and you're the, Fuel <laughs> Oak Ridge story. I'm well, you here, told me to I'm talk here about on, I'm on your side. <laughs> so that's the fast vision. But uh, to go back to 1940 and 1941, again, Vannevar Bush is somebody really worth reading about. Just a tremendous character. Um, and he forms the NDRC and then in 1941 it becomes the OSRD. So the labs that would would have related to you specifically is the met lab is compton's met lab in chicago that's if i've got it right in your x10 and not y12 and that lab did have a challenge in um uh in i won't search for the date here but um compton decided i guess is very early 42 that he was going to consolidate the lab in chicago so he was bringing in people like Wigner, um, Fermi, and all of them were compelled to move to Chicago, to the University of Chicago. Um, but Bush's genius was instead of when this project and many others think radar, uh, rubber, uh, the, North, the bomb sites, just all these uh, physics and chemistry related projects that had to get pushed at the start of World War II, um, rather than try and centralize the scientific effort in the US, he did something that has been termed federalism by contract. And it's actually, it's why, you know, this lab exists in Oak Ridge today is because rather than consolidate national science, they used contracts to keep existing labs in place. So you had Columbia working on K-25's problems, you had the Met Lab working on plutonium. You had the Rad Lab working on Y12. The MIT was working on radar and many others. So uh, just a tribute there to, to Vannevar Bush. And then I just wanted to say about compartmentalization. It, has everyone heard this term? Okay, so it's evident that it was a good idea in the sense that you have Klaus Fuchs and the Soviets getting a jump, it, the, the uh, part of the story in, in the film Oppenheimer. But it was unfortunate when we talk about how many times Oppenheimer visited Oak Ridge, even the program leaders, uh, Compton, Lawrence was back and forth all the time. But, um, but Oppenheimer didn't come out here much. So he wasn't intimately involved in tracking how production of U-235 was going on. And the final thing is just to contextualize it you have to remember how many people were dying in World War II. Yeah. You know, we think it was a race to beat Hitler to the bomb, but you know, the, the general number now, if you look on Wikipedia, is that 70 million people died between say 19, uh, 1937 and 1945, 70 million. So uh, you can say, well, it's, you know, let's say it's on, in very rough terms, it's in, in a Fermi number, it's a million a month. If you can shorten the war by a couple of months, that's significant. So there was compartmentalization was essential, but when I look at it, it would, would have been nice if Oppenheimer had come here more often. <laughs> um, if we have another, who had their hands up first? Paul. <laughs> that's, that's legitimate. <laughs> my, my question is more about the nature of the Manhattan Project. So from what I heard, it was really a massive effort to establish a network of multidisciplinary teams to um, solve or to address uh, an effect of a national or global scale. Um, um, and I, I also see the legacy of the Manhattan Project being the network of national labs we have today. Mm -hmm. But looking to the future, do you see any 
and emerging and strengths and what the students do is it that requires a similar kind of um, you know manufacturing level approach to solving. Mm -hmm. Well, seeing as uh, we're experts in looking forward, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I think for me, so I, I'll start out because something immediately comes to mind to me. So our our organization is part of the weapons program at Los Alamos. And I think that we're seeing something like that play out right now. And I think that we have since the mid 1990s and that's the stockpile stewardship program. Uh, you know, we, I guess maybe sometimes uh, for this, maybe some of you participate in stockpiled stewardship. Uh, sometimes when you're making history, you kind of take for granted that you're, you're making history. After the end of the Cold War, uh, the United States had a large nuclear stockpile that uh, made up of weapons that were supposed to last maybe 10 years before they were replaced by new updated designs. Um, the way that we designed and uh, certified the stockpile and had since 1945 was full-scale nuclear testing. All of a sudden, that tool was taken away. And uh, I believe September 23rd, 1992 was the last U.S. full-scale nuclear test. So a new way to maintain these weapons had to be invented without full-scale testing. Full-scale testing is, is a really good way to do it. It's a nice shortcut. Just go to Nevada and find out what it does can't do that anymore. And so this required, uh, you know, uh, thinking at the Washington level, similar to what General Groves was doing at the time. We needed a, a project manager, a project ar architect. That was Vic Reese, for those of you who, uh, who know Vic. Uh, Vic uh, had what he called navigators at the weapons laboratories. These are people like Mike Anastasio and John Emily, John Brown, if any of those names uh, ring a bell with some of you. These were kind of the technical ambassadors to go out. New facilities had to be created. You know, at Sandia, there was the uh, the Z machine. At Livermore, of course, you have the National Ignition Facility. At Los Alamos, you have DART, the world's most powerful laser. Uh, you see the nation investing literally billions of dollars creating these new facilities and inventing a new way to keep the stockpile. And this is not trivial. You know, as you consider a nuclear weapon, these are very complex um, uh, objects. They're made out of various different things that age at different rates in a hostile environment when you consider the the uh, radioactive nature of, of these. Uh, and so I really do think, you know, to me at least, stockpiled stewardship is, uh, uh, you know, kind of one of the offshoots of the Manhattan Project, maybe a direct offshoot of it. You know, the, the Manhattan, there had been partnership uh, before the Manhattan Project between academia, industry, and the government but not on that scale, not on that massive, massive, massive scale. And so as uh, my friend, uh, well, our friend Jim Konetka likes to say, you know, make no mistake, there is, there is a line directly from Trinity to Tranquility Base. And I think whether it's things like, uh, like the Apollo program, whether it's Human Genome Project, of course, Los Alamos and Oak Ridge have played an important part of that over the years. I think the Manhattan Project is what gave us our template for doing these remarkable things. Let's see. Not, not to mention nuclear medicine, nuclear yes, energy, absolutely, uh, the Navy, you know, all of that comes out of the Manhattan Project. But, uh, uh, you know, I think multidisciplinary, that's, uh, I'm not a historian, I pretend to be one, <laughs> but um, that's a term that's more recent. Uh, you know, the Manhattan Project's, uh, first of all, it's the first mega project, literally, in the sense that it was a billion dollar project. But um, it's also credited or, or accused of being the start of big science, uh, you know, linked in with military industrial complex. When I started work on, uh, when I started reading about the Manhattan Project, my motivation was to think of it, ex I think what you're thinking of, which is Manhattan Project of climate change. Uh, could, could this be, you know, could the history be an inspiration for how we could tackle the existential threat of our time and our children's time. And uh, my working title is an existential enterprise. Stimson referred to the Manhattan Project as an enterprise. And it was an existential enterprise because the threat of Hitler with a bomb was an existential threat. I found, I mentioned this three act structure. Um, the Manhattan Project, I eventually abandoned the Manhattan Project of climate change because I came to realize that how, how, un how unique, 
that the Manhattan Project was unique in the sense that you had, once they decided, once Vannevar Bush told um, FDR that we should pursue this, within weeks, everything was in place. FDR had the War Powers Act. There was never any discussion with Congress. None of it was public. Contrast that to today. Today, we're stuck in Act One, you know, just acknowledging that there's a problem. Act One, again, was December, uh, was Christmas Eve, 1938, to FDR saying, let's take action on this in October 39. Act Two, I don't really think we're in that yet. We're still in Act One, and it's the problem gets worse by the day. So what I've come to think of, at least the, as I, I th think Alan was just saying, it's, it's the epitome of an all-out effort, the Manhattan Project. Um, it, I mentioned to you earlier, it, it, when DuPont, uh, when you analyze Hanford, DuPont said that the work they did there in normal uh, terms would have taken 19 years. In the war, they could have shortened it to 12. At Hanford, they did it in two with the Met Lab. So there'll be huge civil engineering problems down the road. You know, you think about uh, sea, sea rise and, and climate change and all the effects of that. So at least if it can serve as a, um, as a, an example of what we can accomplish, and if it can inspire people like you, who are now students to take up not only science, but also engineering, civil engineering. Um, we have a question online, um, and then we'll get back to the audience here. Did, does, did the, was the Groves family given the opportunity for input into the Oppenheimer movie? Yes. Yeah. And I, what I, did that look like? Well, I, I actually spent a, a week in Los, in Los Angeles with Matt Damon, just going through his presentation. So. I didn't, but uh, <laughs> no, we, no, we weren't, and, and I wouldn't. You were making me jealous, then. No, <laughs> no I love you, some of you. Some of you may know that he that uh, Groves famously drops a couple of f bombs in Oppenheimer. Again, he was a minister's son. He never he, he didn't need to curse if people. That first of all, he had the he had the great advantage of working with the most talented people in the fields not just in science, you know, with people like Oppenheimer and Compton and Lawrence, but in engineering, you, you know, Ray mentioned Stone and Webster. These, uh, Kellex, Kellex was Kellogg, that goes on to become KBR, mm -hmm. if any of you've heard of KBR. I mean, these were the leading companies. There were um, industrial companies that were involved, Westinghouse, for example, companies that no longer exist, but uh, <laughs> at the time were household names. So. He could, when he would visit some of these labs, he's talking to people that are are fully committed, driven, and extremely talented. Uh, so he, no, I didn't. We, I didn't get asked. If I had, I would have referred them to the YouTube videos and said, just understand. If he wanted to express anger at somebody, he didn't shout. Uh, I can never recall hearing him shout. He would just say something very sarcastic to you about your how you had disappointed him. <laughs> that was more powerful anyway yeah 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 for for somebody that's motivated it is question Was I, as I said to them, I was much more impressed in 1967 because when I arrived, they put my name on the billboard of the motel where we were staying in those days. <laughs> um, but that was the 25th anniversary, and I think the community was very, uh, they really wanted to thank my grandfather for the fact that this is here. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, I, I really, I thought I knew the Manhattan Project because I, I knew my grandfather well and worked for him and I knew that it had helped end the war and that was enough for me. I didn't actually read a book about the Manhattan Project. I tried to read his book, 
when I was a teenager, but if any of you have read his book, you know, in the first page, there'll be 20 proper nouns about, you know, people like Compton and Lawrence. And it's, uh, yes, if you've studied the history or nowadays, if you go and read a couple of Wikipedia pages, you could, you could follow things, but it was not the sort of book that was going to engage a teenager. So I then skipped forward 50 years <laughs> and then uh, started working on this project and started reading books. So. Thank you. A couple of questions here in the second row. Hey, this question is for uh, Mr. Groves. I was just curious if your grandfather um, ever told you stories about like um, being present at Los Alamos and like, especially like if he were at the Trinity test. I think he did tell me it's a long time ago. I saw, is it a memory or a memory of a memory or of something that uh, I'm conjuring? I think he actually did tell me. I, I think I knew about Trinity and how they, I believe, lay down on the ground. Yes, yes, but I may have picked that up because, again, when I came in 1967, there was Brighter Than a Thousand Suns mm -hmm. was staged in an open theater here. And I so I may actually be remembering not what he told me, but what I saw acted out in 1967. When I think of General Groves at Trinity, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, he hated the weather, man. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it wasn't supposed to rain and it rained so he was not very pleased with the weatherman there uh the other thing is that he tells a story in an article that he wrote uh many years later and he so so you all know this story about possibly igniting the atmosphere mm -hmm. it was in the movie it gets told over and over again uh at trinity enrico fermi was making jokes about that and General Groves overheard this, and initially it, it greatly perturbed him. But then he wrote years later, he said, you know, but after thinking about it, though, I was grateful that he did that because tensions were so high. I mean, imagine what it must have been like if you were a scientist at Trinity. Uh, I mean, the minutes must have seemed like decades. And, uh, you know, again, I just think that, you know, General Groves as a person is so intriguing to me. But, you know, uh, to, to look at that and recognize the value that a little bit of humor brought to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's what I think about when when I think of general the general there. Thank you. Um, first of all, I really like the dialogue here in the atmosphere. I really appreciate that. Thank y'all so much. But um I, you know, I've been very much aware of the Manhattan Project, but it wasn't until probably five years ago. I even really, really discovered that how much more candid, and I think y'all mentioned that when I was coming in, about candidates and slight involvement. I was wondering if y'all could go into that. I know the Montreal Lab, and then obviously El Dorado, but I just wondered if you could say just a few, some brief on what was Candace's involve, involvement with the Manhattan Project? Um, I can, I can, yeah. Well, El, El Dorado, uh, another, hero of mine from act two is Edgar Sangier, which I was pleased to see was featured in the K-25 museum. Do, do, does that name ring a bell for anyone? Okay, Where so- Where the uranium came from. Yeah, so absent Sangier, this, uh, uh, which uh, he was the managing director of a company called Union Minier de Haute Katanga, a uh, Belgian company that uh, goes back to the disgraceful history of Leopold II in the Congo. But um, uh, Union Minier Sangier's company held the world monopoly on both uh, uh, uranium and radium. Uh, radium, they, uh, uranium was the useless byproduct of the, of the pursuit of radium for medicine in the 1920s and 30s. And Sangier shipped 1,250 tons of very exceptionally, extraordinarily high-grade uranium to Staten Island in late 1940. He'd evacuated Europe. He'd gone to, he was in the Cunard building on, on Broadway in, in New York. And then he moved the, the um, a good portion of his stockpile over. Without that uranium, without those 1,250 tons, there's no bomb in 1945, without a doubt. El Dorado, was a company that uh, Union Minier had brought it brought into its cartel, 
and I won't go into the details because I haven't studied it that much. Um, but I think the, the more important thing than the Canadians, the French and, uh, you know, how von Halben ends up in Montreal. I think the more important is the British mission and what the British did in 1940 with um, Otto Frisch and uh, Rudolf Pyrrhus and Frisch who ends up in Los Alamos. Frisch who is working with Meitner who's walking in the woods of Kungalf on Christmas Eve 1938 and is part of the process of discovering fission. Uh, Meitner has received this strange report from Hahn and Strassmann, but it's Meitner, and I'm delighted to say that because one of the problems of this story is there are very few women in it. And I get asked when I'm talking about what I'm working on, how many women are gonna be involved? And there aren't that many, but Meitner's right at the start of the story. She and Frisch are interpreting that. And then a year later, Frisch and Parles actually start to think of a U-235 bomb. A, that starts the MAUD committee. And a year later, the MAUD committee influences Bush. And uh, the MAUD report influences Bush. And Bush gives a positive report to FDR. And all of this stuff is just converging like tributaries into a river that becomes Manhattan. So I, I'm not addressing the Canadian thing, but Canada, of course, was part of the United Kingdom. And, um, and so I've, I've talked about the British. I, I have a quick reference that I think you'll enjoy. Now, now first, on, uh, I do give a talk and have a book chapter on the British contributions because they really are hugely significant mm -hmm. to this story. They kind of fill that uh, part of that void between the Einstein letter and the Manhattan Project. Yeah. The British are doing lots of work in between there. Uh, for Canada, uh, so, so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, so uh, members of the American Nuclear Society here, so we, we have a few. So the, the journal is nuclear science and, uh, or nuclear technology, I'm sorry. So back in 2021, I believe Los Alamos sponsored a special supplemental issue of, uh, of that publication. And in it, there is an article on Canadian contributions to the Manhattan Project. And I think that it's the one that gets more hits than any others. It was written by a, a husband and wife who work at Los Alamos, and their co-author was a, an obscure scientist named Tom uh, Tom May Mason, <laughs> something something like that. <laughs> so check out check out Tom's article there, and uh, and uh, maybe you could name this auditorium after Tom uh, there too. But but it is there, there's a lot of articles in there that I think that you'll enjoy. But that really I think is is a wonderful source to check out. It's free. It's online, and. Uh, let me know if you can't find it. We'll get it to you. Thank you. Question here. The researchers um, uh, works, right? So how do they able to progress in the early stage of the Manhattan Project since there are so many compartmentalization probably they were just so frustrated. Oh, I am doing, for instance, like breakthrough, but I have no idea what others are doing. So would you just shed some light on Yeah, that was that was a big issue. And I, I don't know, do you, you know, Dick, do you want to talk about this from kind of the the, the, the large scale Manhattan Project? Why? Um, well, I um, I, I think they they had missions for the for the separate labs, you know. So you have Columbia working on gaseous diffusion, Met Lab working on plutonium, and Rad Lab working on electromagnetic separation. And um, initially, all of this was being run by the S one a, a division of the OSRD. Uh, with Conant and the lab heads by, um, I guess it's the end of March, 1943, um, because so much of it's centering on construction, Groves takes over everything. Um, and Groves is advised by Conant and Tolman. So I think the... <laughs> That's her <so> long. <laughs> I guess it works. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the compartmentalization at Los Alamos is, is
Now we know who has a good the, the measures at Los Alamos are probably what you're thinking of and the colloquial is it colloquia? Or the colloquiums, yes, yes. Um, how were they able to collaborate at Los Alamos? But the other labs and the larger project, they could keep it separated. You know, they could, uh, uh, and they needed to because there was espionage. You know, as we now know because of uh, Klaus Fuchs. But that I think there were other. I, I really don't get into espionage much because my <laughs> my the story I'm telling is. I focus, I don't know what the, the words are for historians. I would think, think uh, questions like who, what, when, where. The question I'm trying to address is how. How did they get this done in this remarkably short period of time? So there are a lot of subjects I've had to jettison because uh, espionage and that isn't contributing to how it got done. That's interesting, but it's not a subject I can fit in. But I think the... The other, the labs, the, the three other labs I've mentioned and lots of the other facilities, those could be compartmentalized without having any impact whatsoever. It's really about how Los Alamos is functioning and whether Los Alamos knows how the fuel, what I said before is that had Oppenheimer had a better hand handle on the fuel production, maybe they would have pushed something like implosion a little bit differently, yeah. maybe. You know, I, uh, I, I I lecture on espionage, too, as it turns out. I, I want to come back for a double feature because I love it here so much yeah. uh, here in Tennessee. Um, you know, let me add, so this is not directly about compartmentalization, but it does address kind of the situation between security and science and where they meet, because there's always been tension there, and it's a natural tension. It's an important tension, uh, I think, to have. And uh, this quick story is something that you might not have heard and might not hear anywhere else. Uh, so let me let me ask first, does anyone know who Harold Agnew was? Yeah. There should be so well, there's a few. Okay, so well, Harold was a friend of mine, and uh, he was he Harold died uh, in 2013. It's been tier, ten years ago. He was the third director at Los Alamos, and he was on Enrico Fermi's team at the University of Chicago and helped build the world's first complete nuclear reactor. Uh, and uh, he hated graphite for the rest of his life, by the way, uh, because as a graduate student, he got to stack a lot of it. But the you know Harold told me he pointed out he said you know. Before the Manhattan Project, because remember, between the Einstein letter and the formal, I believe the formal creation of the Manhattan Project, almost three years passed, almost to the day. And, um, you know, scientists knew what this new discovery might mean of, of vision. And, and Harold made the point, scientists self-impose secrecy. Mm -hmm. You know, they did not have security. And of course, security experts are very, very important to, to what we do but they didn't exist at that point in time. It was the scientists who recognized the stakes that, of, of, of this scientific discovery and what it could mean uh, for, for the war, which, which, was, uh, which was looming at that point in time. Security came later and security is a little bit different and security is necessary. Security involves compartmentalization and fences and, uh, and guards and different things like that. Again, both are absolutely necessary, but it's trying to find the right balance between these two. And sometimes that can be very difficult. And it was something that was difficult during the Manhattan Project. And I think to General Groves's credit and to scientists like Bacher and Oppenheimer and others who, who stood up to say, look, if we're gonna get this done, you're going to have to let us get this done. And General Goves listened and made accommodation for that. I think that should be inspirational for us today, those of us who work in the national security business uh, of, of science, at least, to try and find, uh, to try and make sure that we have that right balance. But again, a lot of credit should be given to the scientists for yeah. introducing and secrecy. To and this. very interesting distinction there between uh, uh, between the two. In uh, March of, uh, of 39, Zillard is working at Columbia with uh, Fermi, and Zillard is is very concerned about what Joliot is publishing in France. They're looking into the um, question of secondary neutrons at the time, trying to figure out whether a chain reaction is, is plausible. And uh, Joliot goes ahead and publishes a paper on April 22nd. He's done measurements and says that close to three secondary neutrons will be produced in fission. And that is the proximate cause of the start of the German effort 
on April 29th, uh, 1939. They read Joliot's paper, and there's an answer to a question that's fundamental to whether um, whether a, a nuclear fission can be used either for power or bomb. Now, I'll make one observation about compartmentalization. You've been hearing them talk a lot about what was happening in the labs, in the Met lab, what was happening at Columbia. There was not compartmentalization at that level. When they started the Manhattan Project, think about Y-12, 22,482 people eventually working there in August of 1945. Maybe a hundred, maybe the chemist would have known they were working with uranium. They wouldn't even have known that it was going to be a bomb. But the people who were monitoring the gauges, who were working in the ships, uh, they had no idea what they were actually doing. I mean, Gladys Owen said to me when she came back, I put her on a stool, took her picture. She said, Ray, I never did know what I was doing. They didn't. They just didn't. They didn't need to know. They needed to be trained to do a certain thing and to do it well and do it consistently. Mm -hmm. But those people who were talking about the science part of it, there was no compartmentalization, not nearly the level of compartmentalization that there was down in the working areas. Right, Ray, if this, was, if this was Y-12 uh, y audience, yeah, we could tell we them could the story about the, <laughs> about the Nichols competition with the Calutron girls, but I don't think they'd be interested. But they, it's not they probably know the story. Yeah, it's not Y-12. <laughs> 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 Question uh, online is, I um, thought you could address this, Alan. What were Oppenheimer's views on the risk of a nuclear chain reaction destroying the atmosphere? So, so that, uh, that is uh, portrayed in the movie. I guess, you know, people are still asking about the movie from time to time, and you'll, you'll see that one of the inaccuracies in the movie is there. So in uh, 1942, there was a top secret weapons designed conference at Berkeley. What better place to have a, you know, <laughs> at a public university. Oppenheimer presides over this conference and some important concepts come out of this. For one, the uh, theoreticians figure out how to make a fission bomb in two days. Mm. They, they, they didn't call the engineers <laughs> yet <laughs> and the rest of the team. But Oppenheimer presides over this. They talk about fission bombs for two days. They talk about building a, a hydrogen bomb for the next two or three weeks uh, at, the, at that conference. They also talk about uh, uh, they, they also talk about this idea. I believe that if I remember correctly, Edward Teller, who was there, is the one who raised the, the potential prospect of ignition of the atmosphere uh, there. And I talked about that a little bit earlier. So, so this is pretty serious. I mean, you know, if this is physically possible, this would be the end of the world. If, if it happens. And so Oppenheimer does not go to visit Albert Einstein. He goes to visit Arthur Compton, who's come up several times in our conversation, but did not come in the, uh, come up in the movie. I think Compton was on vacation in Michigan at the time. He's the director of the Met Lab. In yeah, yeah, yes. And uh, so Oppenheimer goes to him to seek his advice on this. And of course, in Compton's book, he's got very dramatic language. He said, you know, it's something like, you know, we would rather surrender to the tyranny of the Nazis than end mankind by by doing this it's something like that in his book uh, called atomic quest but it was very quickly uh, deduced that you know this is essentially impossible beta was at that conference and he uh, so teller brings up the this is very much how that conference went teller would come up with ideas Hans Beta would do math, and <laughs> they went back and forth. And Teller, well, Teller would say it, I think, pretty much in those terms as well. But still, that that was that was the first thing is that Beta did the rough uh, the rough calculations. This is not something that's going to happen. Oppenheimer, to the question, went to Compton to consult him as well. Now, uh, another person who was present at that meeting was Emil Konopinski. And Konopinski did more uh, refined calculations on this. And these were formalized in laboratory reports that were published, I think, in 1946. But the work had been done long beforehand. So that's what I think that's what enabled Fermi to make jokes about it at mm -hmm. Trinity, because the scientists knew that that was not going to happen. Yeah, it seemed to be dramatized in the movie. Oh, 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 <laughs> but but there's a very specific experiment that was taken here in Oak Ridge by Alex Zucker. You know Alex Zucker? Uh, from the laboratory. The experiment still stands in Beta 3 at Y12, where he did the experiment when they were talking about the hydrogen bomb and literally proved that it would not ignite the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Now, I obviously don't know enough to tell you what he did, 
but I know the experiment is there in those calutrons and that he did that experiment when he was first brought into this area to work. And that was concerned about the hydrogen bomb igniting the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Alex Sucker did that. Thank you. Question here in the front, the microphone. Okay, back here and then could someone bring, Jared, would you bring a microphone up here, thanks. This feels like a good spot to transition a little bit. You've talked about uh, compartmentalization and how many people knew and that there were a great many workers who didn't know, but there was also the involvement in, of the army and counterintelligence and actively fomenting um, false narratives uh, to, to help prevent the spread of real information. And, and those of us who, who grew up here in East Tennessee or have been have been steeped in that for many years. I wonder if, if you'd talk a little bit about that. I can I can I can get us started with the Los Alamos perspective. If it's okay with uh, with Dick now, <laughs> we're, we're right here. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, this was a big deal, and uh, so a couple of quick things just from what we were doing in Los Alamos, and maybe there there are similar stories here as well. Um, there were rumors. I mean, you know, what was going on at Los Alamos? Okay, and uh, because you've got this area that was very sparsely populated. There were about 35 homesteading uh, families there, and there was a school for boys. They were all evicted at the end of 1942. All of a sudden, you've got all this construction, construction companies, all, all this building, uh, all these people who are moving up there. All of a sudden, you have you know, multiple children being born every month in Los Alamos at a place where children generally were not born at all. How do you cover that up? And so the rumor started. And I think uh, I think that the uh, Army intelligence was very glad to, to, to let these rumors go. Some of them were, were, were just completely wild. Like there was a secret underground submarine base there with a tunnel all the way to the ocean, <laughs> things like that. Something that was a bit more plausible, you know, I, I mentioned the, women, the Women's Army Corps, uh, which made, uh, you know, about 70, 75 women who were with it there in that capacity made very, very valuable contributions in a variety of roles there from secretarial to technicians work things like that um and as i mentioned before all of a sudden you've got all of these children being born up there there was a rumor going around that los alamos was a camp for wayward wax to go and have their children <laughs> you know all this type of stuff and again the military just ate it up because that's good because we don't yeah. want people to catch on to what's going on because it was very secret and for very obvious reasons one you know if hitler can have a nuclear monopoly the next day we just don't want to help in any way there but i think also is that you know as the war comes to uh, to a close to, as it gets into the final chapter nuclear weapons were these were very much psychological weapons you know the the united states the army air forces could already cause great destruction and had had firebomb many cities in japan the idea was to introduce a, a, a weapon that was completely unexpected, a weapon that was irresistible, uh, a weapon that would demonstrate to the Japanese that, look, you're not even going to get to fight back against this. They wanted to completely maximize the shock value of this new weapon. Uh, any information getting out, anything like that, uh, would uh, potentially blunt the psychological damage that it would cause and therefore the war might continue on and then on top of that you know uh, the cold war was at hand now the cold war i think started back in 1917 1918 we we never really liked or trusted the soviet union the united states did not diplomatically uh, acknowledge the soviet union until 1933 and so there was this brief moment in time being world war ii where the united states and the soviet union had the common enemy of adolf hitler you know, Stalin was one of the greatest mass murderers in the world. We certainly don't want to help him either. As Dick alluded to, there were there were actually four spies at Los Alamos that have been identified. Hopefully that's the end of them. The most recent was identified in 2019. So, so you know, all of this disinformation, all these stories going around, any rumor that had nothing to do with the reality would be, you know, uh, welcomed. In, in a place like Los Alamos and the same with Oak Ridge, Hanford, uh, and all of the other por portions of the Manhattan Project as well. I'll tell one quick story about uh, secrecy and how to maintain, how they tried to maintain the secrecy. After the war ended and a few years later, they formed a club here in Oak Ridge called the 43 Club for those people who were here in 1943. And at the second meeting, at the end of the meeting, a man held his hand up and said, I'd like to ask a question. He said, I was required to keep a stack of blank three by five cards in my pocket. And if I heard anyone talking about the project, 
I was to write down what was being said, who said it and where, and I will send it to the Acme Finance Company. If I didn't hear anything on Friday, I had to send a blank card in. I wonder if anybody else had to do that. About half the people in the room held their hand up. <laughs> so they were spying on one another. Uh, the second one, real quick, I uh, I was given a tour at Y-12, bringing some people out of the Calutron building. And these two gentlemen were walking uh, behind me. And I was sort of leading the way. And I heard one of them say to the other one, should we tell him? And of course, I slowed down. <laughs> I said, <laughs> tell him what? He said, you remember when those Calutrons failed? in uh, Alpha One and when they were first put in. And I said, yes, I've heard about that story. General Groves came down and made the decision to pull them out and get them cleaned and put them back. They said, yes, and they sent the two of us down here and told us to get jobs as cleaners around that equipment and to find out who was sabotaging those calutrons. Mm -hmm. They were FBI agents that had been sent down to see if there was sabotage going on. I said, did you find any? They said, no, everybody was patriotic. They just told us to stay down here and keep watch. And we did for the whole Manhattan project. It's amazing. And there was a spy in Oak Ridge. In fact, there were three of them. George Coble is the one that's most famous about Oak Ridge. If you want to read about him, the name of the book is The Sleeper Agent by Ann Hagedorn. We have a question here. Uh, yes, I, I guess this would be for uh, Mr. Carr. Uh, in, in case you're aware of this, uh, my wife was reading a book and she was talking about a lady who ran a small uh, restaurant along the road uh, and that uh, she would talk about uh, people were coming down from Los Alamos, where she didn't know what it was, but, but the, the, like there was a guy, Mr. Baker, which I guess was uh, Boar, right? Boar okay, could you elaborate at all about, about that? What, what was the last part of that? Uh, you could you elaborate on oh, oh, yes, that? yes, yes. So, you know, the I guess the remains of that house are still there uh, as you cross the Rio. And so uh, it was run, the woman's name was Edith Warner. I believe that there's a biography of her written by uh, Peggy Pond Church, if you'd, uh, if you'd like to look that up. And do let the group know if I've got that wrong. Uh, <laughs> but it's but it's a wonderful story, uh, her life. Edith Warner had come to the, uh, to the American West. I think that her job down there, there had been a railway at that point in time or something. And it was just to make sure that, you know, that nothing was stolen that was taken off the train at that stop. Uh, there's more about it in the biography, but the connection to Los Alamos is she just basically had this little tea room in her house and you could make reservations there and, and go to dinner. She had her own recipes. In fact, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our librarians at the uh, National Security Research Center where we work at Los Alamos wrote an article on her and uh, included her recipe for, it was like a chocolate raspberry cake, is, is that right? If you would like to make Edith Warner's chocolate raspberry cake, we at the NSRC would be happy to set you up with the, uh, with the recipe. Uh, it's, it's great, it's best when fresh. Uh, I, I would add, but this was this was something. It became a wonderful memory for many people at the laboratory who went down there. I mentioned Harold Agnew earlier. You know, Harold and his wife Beverly uh, went down there. So did some of the other, many of the other scientists who were at the laboratory. So that's become kind of an important part of kind of our our you know the legend of wartime Los Alamos, and it was a real part. So. We have a question online about Sandia's history courses and whether you've attended any of those. Um, yeah, so Sandia, uh, Sandia does have a lot of different uh, learning programs there. I've, I've been able to sit in on some and uh, give some of the talks as part of the program. I should mention since Sandia came up, uh, this as we talk about the Manhattan Project, this is very much Sandia's history uh, as well. Sandia didn't become an independent laboratory until I believe it was 1948, but it started out as a wartime Los Alamos division. And, uh, you know, I show this map of the Manhattan Project. I think it was created by the Department of Energy, and it has lots of dots on it, but it doesn't have all the dots that existed as part of the Manhattan Project. For instance, uh, Los Alamos Z division was down at Kirtland Air Force Base, and that's uh, their job was, I bet you know it, to, to basically take the nuclear components and make them deliverable, which is kind of what Sandia continues to do to this day in the complex. So it's shared, uh, it shared history with Sandia as, uh, as, as well. Hmm. One question here. Um, <laughs> we want to use a mic for the folks online. 
Um, you talk a lot about the activities of the war. Um, I grew up in Los Alamos. I I'm very curious about, I don't think it was all work and no play. Um, could you talk about maybe in Los Alamos and also in Oak Ridge? What was the social life in those days? What did they do? Sure. Do you, you want to talk about Oak Ridge first? Or? I'll quickly talk about Oak Ridge. As I said, it was a 24-hour-a-day operation, so they did have entertainment, movie theaters in all of the little communities. They did dances on the tennis courts. Uh, and you, you might know that General Groves recognized the people coming in here would expect and want some of the, the amenities that they had had in the places where they left. Now, this is in the middle of rural East Tennessee, but he hired Alden Blankenship and told him to build a school system, the best in the nation, and pay the teachers the same salary they would get if they were in New York City. So that came into Oak Ridge because of the knowledge that we needed that kind of entertainment activities uh, to keep the people happy for being here, uh, working on what they didn't sometimes even know what they were working on. So there was a lot of uh, movie theaters and and uh, dances on the tennis courts and those sorts of things. So Los Alamos. Yeah, at Los Alamos, you know, the uh, schedule was six days a week, and these were long days, often 12-hour-plus days. Uh, and so it was a very intense work schedule. They didn't have much time off, and I think they tried to take advantage of it when they when they didn't have to work on that extra day. And so we're very fortunate because uh, one of the scientists there, uh, Hugh Bradner, who went on to invent the wetsuit, <laughs> you know, a lot of these scientists at the laboratory went on and did all these things afterwards as well. Uh, he and his wife, Marjorie, uh, Marge Bradner, they, for reasons I don't know, but I'm sure glad they were allowed to, were able to film a lot of things that were going on in Los Alamos during the war. We have these beautiful color films. They're, they donated the original films to our repository. Uh, it's about 50 minutes of footage. It has been uploaded to YouTube, and I do have a personal YouTube channel. Uh, I don't make money off of it, uh, but if you'd like to see the Bradner films, as they're called, you can just look up the Bradner films and it'll come up, or you can search for Alan Carr Historian, if you just search Alan Carr on YouTube, you get something completely different. So <laughs> Alan Carr, historian, if you'd like to see these. But uh, but what you will see in the films, there's a little bit of work going on at the laboratory, including working with a radio lanthanum source. That's why I'm like, there's this film should not exist. But <laughs> but but I'm glad it does now. But there there's horseback riding. They're skiing. You can see Hans Beta skiing uh, there on an improvised uh, ski hill. Uh, there's there's fishing. I think there's some pistol shooting going on. I mean, it's uh, you can see the scientists. This was kind of their one day a week where they got to go out and do whatever they wanted. Uh, there were a lot of parties. I mean, some of these are legendary parties, and we have pictures from some of them. Oppenheimer's house was uh, well known for being the place to, you know, you really wanted to get into the director's house to have a, be a part of Oppenheimer's party, to have him, you know, to get a martini and have him light your cigarette for you. Uh, the, you know, that's that's the type of thing that went on there. I believe there was a movie theater as well, but, uh, but again, uh, instead of listening to me, you can watch them uh, on the, uh, the Bradner films there. Mm -hmm. And I'll mention that Hanford was probably the most challenged uh, if any of you have visited Hanford, it's in the middle of a desert and a high desert and uh, at the far corner of the country and they had to pull people from across the country. At 19, in uh, mid 1944, they peaked at about 50,000 workers and they were having real retention problems. So if you read uh, Groves's memoir, Now Can Be Told, it's surprising how much he writes about providing services and entertainment for people at Hanford. In, in Oak, Oak Ridge was built without a city center entertainment wise, it was spread out, which is part of Oak Ridge's challenge today is there's no historic courthouse and city center to revitalize around. Uh, one follow-up question we received online is um, perhaps Ray, you could speak to this. How were entertainment options different for black workers in the Hutton? Uh. Uh, they, they were extremely different. Uh, there was only one theater that they could attend, and they could only attend in the balcony of that theater. And uh, they, they did have uh, recreation halls for blacks and for whites. Whites had many more recreation halls. There was just one for the African Americans. And uh, it, it existed to the extent that you might imagine it was 
They were ex excluded from almost everything. One development that's interesting in light of what we talked about in that regard is that in the 50s with Brown versus Board of Education, the Oak Ridge Reservation was the first in the country to uh, desegregate because there was no involvement of governors or state legislatures. The, the, it was a federal yep. location that was and the decision was yep. just made. September of 1955, to be very specific, it was the first public school uh, and public is defined by federal funds as well as state funds. So it was a plus two, Robertsville and, high, and the high school were the first two schools, public schools, desegregated in the Southeast. Now there were a couple in Arkansas that were desegregated sooner, but this was the first in the Southeast. And, when did and you might think in the, in, the, in the deep South, in the, in the segregated South, and remember, we desegregated two schools, but we didn't integrate Oak Ridge until end of the 60s. And some would say we're still working on it today. And when did Clinton desegregate? Uh, in 56. 56. And one year later, and then Little Rock was in 57. Yeah, the Green McAdoo Museum in Clinton. Yeah, it's a worth, neat museum. Worth the visit. Um, for Alan, is the, I don't even know what this means, but I'm hoping you do. Never stopped me before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you get to make up a new one. <laughs> Is the drink cart rumor about Los Alamos true? It has been said that there was a margarita cart that was offered as entertainment. Did, can we put that in the suggestion box? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, th this this isn't my area of expertise. Um, <laughs> um, I, I mentioned Oppenheimer's martinis. That's actually what came to mind. Is he was he was well known for his right. the personal mixes. In fact, I think that the Historical Society offers a uh, martini do. glass with the recipe etched into it. Yes. So you can get that online or come visit us. But as far as the margarita cart, whoever well, asked. Whoever asked that question, let me know more about that. Yeah, so, <laughs> send me your rumors, and I'll pass connect you with. Yes, that. yeah. Let's. Uh, <laughs> we have, we have less than fifteen minutes left. Um, we have one question here, and then we'll ask for. Uh, this is a great group. Oh, it it's is a, good yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. What do you What do you make of the revisionist historians who say that it was really the Soviet Union's no. declaration of war on uh, on August seventh that led to the capitulation of Japan? And that they were experiencing just as bad bombings from the fire bombings, and it, like the Tokyo bombing was worse than Hiroshima. So the nuclear uh, attacks were not as bad. They were already experiencing that. And that they just pretended that the nuclear uh, attacks were the cause, which allowed them to save face. Right. So I, I, I could speak to this, and I imagine my colleagues will have something to uh, to add to it. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll I'll start out with as a historian is I think that when you when you use the phrase revisionist historian, I think that that's valid. But I, I would add to that in a more gen general sense, uh, hist uh, historians sh are always revising history, and should. The question is based on what, and so I revise my presentations all the time based on finding new evidence. For instance, you know, Dix uh, has sent me a couple of documents very recently from the Military Policy Committee I had not seen before, you know, specifically mentioning the Japanese fleet at truck in the Pacific as the target of the first atomic attack all the way back in 1943. May of 1943. Right. First so, I'd heard of that. Too. Yes. And so, so, you know, as we uncover more evidence, we do want to revise the story to more closely react reality. Now, why else might people change the history, revise it? I, it could be anything, you know, but it could be politics or this or that or whatever else. Now, the specific question uh, about, you know, why nuclear weapons were used. 
I think that that is answered specifically and directly by an article that was written by Barton Bernstein uh, in the mid 1970s. And I think it's called Roosevelt Churchill and the Atomic Bomb, something like that. I can get you the exact title. I, I know Bart Bernstein. He's a professor at Stanford. Uh, he's been there for many years uh, now. He's wonderful to talk with. If you ever try and call him, plan on at least an hour uh, of chat with, with Bart. Um, he, he goes through the original source documentation in this article. It's well referenced. And this is the argument that he makes. And again, it's based on the documentation, not his feelings or this or that, just what the documentation says. Nuclear weapons were used to end the war. That's the reason that they were used. Uh, okay, nuclear weapons were used. And then we'll get to the, the, the Japanese perception of this in a moment. And hopefully I'll answer the, the, the right question. Um, but but it was noted by policymakers that the use of nuclear weapons could have a serendipitous benefit in that they might intimidate the Soviet Union. And as I believe Dolly Parton has said, if intimidating Stalin's wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> uh, or or so, something, somebody, maybe it was Dolly who said that. But uh, <clears throat> but the reason that they were used was to was to end, end the war. Now, that's mm. our side. Now, what about the Japanese perspective? What persuaded the Japanese to surrender. In the Japanese government, uh, at the top, you have the emperor. The emperor is viewed as a deity, and he is not a puppet of the military, as I'll demonstrate uh, quickly in just a moment. Beneath the emperor, you have the Supreme War Council. The Supreme War Council is made up of senior military and civilian leaders of the country, including the most powerful soldier in the country, General Anami. Before the atomic bombings and before the Soviet Union entered the war on August 8th, this, the, the Supreme War Council had been divided basically in two. You had most of the military people in the, in this, uh, on the council. They were ready to end the war, and they had been for a long time but they wanted to dictate terms. And the conditions were basically, we get to keep the land under our possession. They can't occupy the Japanese islands. They can't try us for war crimes. They must continue to respect the sovereignty of his majesty, uh, or we will take our 100 million people to their deaths defending the emperor. That was their view. So yeah, Japan was ready to end the war on their terms, at least that half. The other portion of the Supreme War Council, uh, they said, Let's just go for one term, considering we're getting pummeled. I don't know they added that last part, but I think it was part of this. Um, they said, let's demand that they respect the prerogatives of his majesty, uh, royal majesty, as sovereign ruler of our country. So after the bombing of Nagasaki, they had a meeting. They had a debate, and we have a transcript. It's not verbatim. It was written by somebody who was there, an admiral, after the fact. But we do have a transcript of what was said. They argued back and forth uh, on this. They talked about the war situation. General Anami, you know, said, look, we're, we're you know, Soviet Union, you know, we're not going to surrender to an immoral nation like the Soviet Union. And we are prepared to face an invasion, even by the United States. He downplayed all of these threats because he's already made the decision that he is going to die. And so is the rest of the country before they surrender unconditionally. The civilians are still at the same place. They're like, let's just get this one, let's try and get this one term So, uh, for, from the Allies. So think about that. Before the atomic bombings and Soviet entry into the war, essentially nothing had changed in the minds of the Supreme War Council. They go to the emperor at about 2.30 in the morning on August 10th and say, you know, God, we have not been able to reach a decision will you make a decision for us? This, I believe, was unprecedented. They asked for Go Sedan, a sacred decision. So the emperor, teary-eyed, and I'm not very sympathetic considering that this is a country that may have outmurdered Nazi Germany. He gives a short speech. He says that, you know, there's no way we can win this war, especially considering the overwhelming technological superiority of the allies. What do you think he's alluding to? I, I think he is. Yeah. You know, that's pretty clear to me. And, and so he authorizes the civilians, the civilian group, to go out and make a deal. So on later that day, August 10th, later in the morning, they send uh, a, a, their first peace offer to uh, the United States through the Swiss embassy. And they say, look, we're ready to end the war uh, so long as you continue to, or so long as you respect the prerogatives of his royal majesty as sovereign ruler. Okay, and the, these documents are easy to find, but if you can't find them, I can send you all this documentation. Uh, so anyway, that offer 
is rejected the same day. The Secretary of State sends a telegram back and says, from the moment of surrender, the emperor, the government, the military will not have any authority. Ultimately, your people will vote on what type of government they want. And, and the person who's going to be sovereign in Japan is our military uh, uh, leader, or our, uh, uh, the military general, uh, whatever his title was, General Douglas MacArthur, the military governor of Japan. Take it or leave it. And the Japanese took that agreement. The way that I think of this is that no one thing ended World War II in victory. Uh, it was just uh, like, you know, when you're making a cake, it takes many ingredients to produce that outcome. Uh, some ingredients are more important than others. But I would say, it's my opinion, a lot of these ingredients, when you're weighing the value, it's somewhat subjective. And that's why you get a range of opinions on, on this. To me, it's very clear that nuclear weapons played an important role in ending the war, but it was a non-exclusive role. The Soviet invasion of Manchuria and South Sakhalin Island was also important. So was the fact that Japan had been firebombed significantly, that they were on the brink of starvation, uh, that the domestic situation, as the Japanese uh, leaders called it, uh, basically, everything was about to break down in the country. Their ability to rule was about to break down. And that's why I think that multiple Japanese uh, commentators that I've seen, and we talked about this a little bit last night, viewed nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons, and specifically said this, as gifts from God, because it gave them a reason to end the war and to surrender unconditionally, which they did. So that's that's my take on it. Uh, you know, whether, you know, Beyond that, arguing, oh, it was nuclear weapons, oh, it was the Soviet entry, or any other thing. No, it was a mix of things, and nuclear weapons were a key ingredient, according we, to the Japanese. We are we are about out of time. I uh, I want to close by asking each of you. Um, this was submitted online, um, and I'll give you thirty seconds to think about it. What led each of you to develop such an interest in the history of the Manhattan Project? And then I would add, and would you recommend a book to folks to, to read about this? I would, uh, while you think about it, um, thank you for the dis wonderful discussion. I was thinking about the big science question, your comments about big science and E.O. Lawrence, which I think um, Brian I think was the person who asked about that. There's a book called Big Science, which is about E.O. Lawrence. Um, that I'd recommend, written by Michael Hiltzik, um, that that sort of speaks to the development of a scientific enterprise that relies on these large facilities like we have at Oak Ridge. It's very thought-provoking, and this idea that Paul asked of, well, what's the what's the problem that's going to motivate us now, going forward in this way? Uh, that, that's sort of the question, and and I think. Uh, if you're if you're curious about this and pursuing it more, it's a thought provoking book. So, why are you so interested in this, and what book would you recommend to this group? Um, they pay me. <laughs> um, no, I took care of that. So, so very quickly, since we just have a few seconds, when I when uh, when I went into graduate school, I wanted to be a medieval professor. Uh, I became a teaching assistant and decided I didn't want to be a professor of anything. <laughs> so I, I loved graduate school, though, and uh, the job uh, that comes up every generation for Los Alamos historian came up. I ended up studying the early Soviet military in graduate school instead of medieval history. And uh, that turns out is not a bad thing to know coming into this job, because when we're talking about World War II and the Cold War, why did these conflicts emerge? To understand the Soviet Union and that nation and how it came into existence uh, was and remains very useful to me. I applied for the job, got it. They do pay me to do this, believe it or not. I have a blast and I get paid to do it. Uh, but uh, that's that's my story. You're charging now. Right? I'm charging right now. <laughs> Thank you to the taxpayers for... <laughs> So I, I agree with Dave on the big science. I think it's a great book. Uh, the other one, two others I'd recommend. Books, yeah. yeah, one, oh, you didn't get to recommend books. I, 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 so so uh, there's so many, but for those of you who are interested in the technical history of the Manhattan Project, 
Uh, a book that you might not be aware of is called Critical Assembly. Uh, this is an official history of wartime Los Alamos, and it was written by my predecessor, Roger Mead, and several others who had access to all of the documentation, both unclassified and classified. So they were able to extract the unclassified uh, history from that. So Critical Assembly by Roger Mead, Catherine uh, Hodgson, and all. You can probably find this. a copy on uh, Amazon for $600. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, your library. It's out of yeah. print. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, my, okay that'll we'll be see. easier to find. Big science for sure. But then Richard Rhodes' book that I found to be the best one for the overall biggest picture. Stan Norris's book is good too. Yes. But uh, the Thank you for the atomic bomb. Yes, yeah, for the atomic bomb. And the I have to say that just like that one, uh, the Road to Trinity by Nichols is impossible to find now but it's a good book. And then Denise Karanen's book, Girls of Atomic City, I would recommend that. Why did I become so interested in history? Uh, I'll make it really short. I looked around and there wasn't anybody doing it. There was not anyone emphasizing the history, of not only of the Manhattan Project, but the history of Oak Ridge to the extent that I thought it should be. And I thought if anybody's going to do it, why not me? I like it. I'm going to try it. And I would suggest to you that it's an important thing. Uh, very quickly, when the Cold War ended, there was discussion about taking Y-12 and moving it out to the Nevada test site. All of a sudden, I became the spokesman of Y-12 and started doing presentations, making tours, making documentaries, promoting Y-12, which had never been done before. And I would suggest to you that there would be benefit for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory to invest in the in historians to help us to spread the word about the amazing history, not only of the Manhattan Project, but what came out of it. I mean, come on, folks, even the touch screen technology on your iPhone was invented in Oak Ridge. Let's talk about it. Let's be proud of it. Let's hire some historians. Uh, yes. <laughs> Nick? I think I must have been uh, <laughs> driven by Ray, but uh, I give an award every year at West Point in Groves's name, and I realized that most of the people that I was giving it to had no idea what the Manhattan Project was. Then I started to get to know what the Manhattan Project was and saw that it was actually not that, but a longer story. Yeah. And I uh, thought the best way to deliver this now um, is with a lot of visual content. So eventually that led to a documentary but I'm also hoping at some point to have an illustrated history out. And uh, some of the things that I've mentioned hopefully will be much clearer when rendered with timelines and photos. As for books, I would say uh, for anyone that isn't really familiar with the history, go to the DOE um, PDF that you can download, 110 pages, lots of pictures, mm -hmm. lots of pictures of Oak Ridge and Hanford and Los Alamos. It's uh, the author's name is Gosling, G O S L I N G. That's Skip, Skip Gosling. He was um, the historian for the DOE. And it's free. And it's and if uh, you you won't fall asleep on it because you encounter large pages of pictures that move you forward quickly. And the other one that relates to Hanford, but hence to X10, um, is a book by a man named Harry Thayer, who wrote for the American mm -hmm. Society of Civil Engineers and uh, gives an engineering perspective on how extraordinary DuPont's work was in World War II. Again, this the thing that I mentioned, 19 years compressed to, to two. He's a civil engineer who knew how to look at things like feasibility and costs and explains it very clearly with pictures and data and diagrams and such. It's, um, it used to be, you could download it as a PDF for free five years ago. I think now you have to actually pay the ASC some money. The, the general's memoir. Don't, now don't let Dick intimidate. Well, well, but, <laughs> but again, if you um, if you haven't read it, it takes it. So I think it becomes an everybody that uh, is involved in it in any depth says it's kind of addicting. Uh, you have to get to know some of the characters. You have to um, you have to hear something like Gassy's diffusion and not have to think about what that is. Um, so it, my, my grandfather's book is, he doesn't, uh, he's not trying to write for the layperson. 
It's quite good, though. It yeah, is. Good. It, it is. really I is. He is very yeah. articulate and thorough. Well, as a thank you all, as a token of appreciation, we will give each of you a Tennessee lapel pin. Wow. Um, the <laughs> discovery made of Tennessee. Ten it's not, <laughs> not, not made of Tennessee. <laughs> but have a microgram of it in there. <laughs> sure, sure. So it's worth a hundred thousand dollars. I think. <laughs> um, but let's give a. Mainly, we want to give you a warm round of applause and thank you for your time. <laughs>